interrupting the current neo-coronial cricketism to bring you Behind the Woodshed. This is Cricket Tube Busting Episode BTWRLM384. Things working all right. Seems like I get behinder and behinder behind the woodshed. Can't quite move fast enough. Everything seems to be falling apart, trying to keep it all up. Keep it all working. The system hopefully will hold together. Again, last week we had a, I think it was last week we had a power outage. We had some little bit of problem that's not not really relevant today. That I may have a problem posting the after the show. We'll see. I just got in late, so I'm not quite sure how it's going to work for us. It seems like there's little obstructions here and there, and just about everything that uh, gets done anymore. And I don't know why. Interesting how these little things pop up, but. Uh, We've been moving along through here, and I've been helping people and thinking about how we do this thing. And this thing I'm talking about is utilizing this fraud against us, this medical fraud, medical martial law that everyone seems to agree with, to stop it. And it's not that hard. At least my estimation is as far as getting the record made, getting the position properly before those so-called authorities, all these criminals that call themselves officials or governors or whomever that have not done the independent local study and have not followed their law, uh, the black and white, that statutory code, rule, whatever it is you find that says there's a duty to do certain things when they failed, and they have to because of the way this thing works. So what is coming on us, is, and it ends up being a cover for the global governance thing, sustainable development. It's what most people think is the Hegelian dialectic as well. It's all coming together here is how I can see all this. Not that I'm an expert on it. That's how I've had to been doing this, looking at this thing for over 10 years by itself on dealing with it, actually longer, if I think about it, more like 15, 16 years. And so this is a, we can make records to start outing it. And I've told you, our, my experience is we make the right record outing it, and we adhere to the principles of the black and white principles, and our options are a lot more narrowed down, but they're a lot more clear. And we're not going to be as easily beat up as I've seen people in the past relative to the corruption that we have to enter into, which is the courts or talking to a reticent uh, governor who thinks that they've got this thing and the court's given it to them and uh, the bar association sitting back in there. You kind of have to address all this. I don't want to get too complicated on that at this point. i just like to see you guys, all your folks just start writing letters of inquiry based on statute because. That'll give you a start on how you communicate. You're gonna, the way this is rolling down and the way I told you it would roll out is you're gonna have to have your own bag of law for each one of you anyway. Otherwise, all this stuff that's mandatory that you complain about and you say you're not gonna do, you're gonna do it. And you're not gonna have a word in your mouth. You're not gonna have a proof in your hand, uh, in, in even, even a summary form in order to say there, you're, you're, you have a problem on your hands and that these things are, what you're doing is illegal as far as someone trying to make an imposition, as I told you, they'd shift the problem, the government would shift the problem to you against local people, and they have, and no one seems to be able to stop it. So, and then this is part of that, not creating an administrative record. I was thinking about this as well. Your letter starts an administrative, because it's dealing with the administrative agency for your health system, it's an administrative record that starts a question that they have to answer. The open-endedness of it continues your ability to to have a position as well. So not only do you have an administrative resolve a, a condition that's going on that's not ripe, as the gov- as a, as the uh, judiciary would say, that goes on, and you are protected by that question when your position is based in law. And there's a question. It's not a question. This is the other point I want to say here. It's not a question that they haven't followed it. And so that you don't ask a question. If you write a letter, you're not asking the question. You're asking for the production of the evidence they complied with the law. And I'm speaking this way because it's, it seems to be everyone's running into the same wall in a way. And, and there's not a perception of what's going on. The, you have to find, here, here, look at the presumption is the government, the, here, just go to the presumptions. The, the presumption is for the rules of evidence is the law has been followed. The other presumption is the sovereign, the government, is has done no wrong. And so you have to answer to those. Those are not questions. Those are re- a demand for the fulfillment of the evidence that they have complied with the law. 
And so what I'm offering you is is just so subtle in the way it's approached. I really think people miss it. And I don't think people appreciate the condition they're in. A- absolutely not. That this is thing has gone on forever like this. Where essentially there is no test to base the whole thing on. And this is the crux of it all. It, it's, it comes down to right, right at the beginning of the process. When you're asking your health authorities, they got you underneath this problem, and you're asking the authorities to produce the evidence of the fulfillment of the statute that said they were supposed to make a determination, make a certification, verify, whatever the word is in your state, and they're different, and they're located different in your state statutes, is the more people that come to ask me for help, uh, we look around, I don't have a clue about all these state statutes until they're brought to me. Uh, Some are better than others, some are more clear than others. Some are in the code, some are split between the law, some are even down into the policies within an agency. You, you have to track through each state. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but you're talking about being forced into a way of life that you are not going to like. You're going to be forced into vaccinations. You're going to be forced into action or in action. They're going to be stealing you off the face of the earth and put you wherever they want you. And uh, I've been trying to prepare you for all this and have a better position. And I've said before, my experience is you put the proper position and all of a sudden they don't want to touch with you. They don't want to mess with you too much. Now, this will be more of a blanket roll-up because they get what they get is the third-party businesses to call the third the cops, third-party cops on you who are deemed to be doing no wrong and deemed to be following lawful orders. And you have nothing in your hands to show, wait a minute, there's a question. You don't have this right. Not only do you have, don't have the statuses and you don't have the proper authority. Your enforcement is based on a on something that even the health department can't do. It hasn't done, hasn't shown me. Here's the letter, and this is why I get you down. I'm getting you from if you for the, if you think a court case is difficult, I'm trying to pull you down into something you can still do. Write a letter. It doesn't it's like one sentence is, is all the letter has to be relative to the statute you have to go find. Whether that's a code, a rule, um, it could be a, it's a statute. It's actually a rule. It's an administrative rule. Whether it's a policy consideration. But all this stuff is written down. It's actually more in the rules and the codes. It's already written down for you. So why this has been a problem, I don't know. But I want to get quickly over to BitChute comment over Torn uh, Earth Shaman. And, you know, it's a long-distance discussion. He brings the comments over to BitChute, and I'm having to wait maybe a week or two before I can figure out how to get at it. As I said, I'm getting somehow I'm getting obstructed from getting into certain things. And also, i got to let you know, Twitter is becoming useless to me. I don't even know how much more I want to put up with. They want to do all this stuff. They say it's not working. It's like a browser. No, they do everything they want perfectly. I can't hardly do anything uh, on it, and they interfere with what I'm doing most of the time. And so I'm not sure the life of all this. How how ba- how Twitter is more than a beta test right now, and have have they make demands on people and they control people? I don't even know. I don't even know how that thing is, uh, has survived at this point. But uh, I'm just gonna let you know. Twitter's becoming less and less usable, and I don't know how much. Uh, how much it really helps. I don't see much support for myself. I've been on, if I take any uh, matching, I came from Oracle Broadcasting. Uh, Doug told me to come on to Twitter. We both got on relatively the same time. He went up to like 50,000. I, I had, I think I got 100 uh, followers. So to, there's a disparagement between, uh, I don't know how, between the two accounts. And then uh, and then he cut out all of his, who he was following. He had 50,000, he cuts it down to 10,000. I don't even know how you follow that many people. But in the meantime, I get blocked out. And so this Twitter is not real, not real good. It, and it, it doesn't have a following that wants to come to listen to what I have to say. I haven't figured that out. People say resist, 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 and no one provides any, at all, any answer as to how that's going to happen. And that's all I provide behind the woodshed that I, that, that I don't have more people that are interested in that, whether you follow me or just do it like a lurker. It doesn't matter to me. Are you doing something that I can't get out, that I, this information doesn't get out and people don't promote it, is really an astonishing thing to me. As I'm watching a, a global, global society, now, uh, indiv- individual jurisdictions now, I'm not coming, bringing them all together, a global societies falling in the face of this fraud and everyone's helpless to it. It's fascinating to me, but it's very sad too. And, and so I come every every week, and we, I hope somebody change. I see more more of you are coming to ask, so that's great. But we have to be a better, a more functional society against the oppression that's on us. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. And and I told you to look for the law. That's the only bright line we have. That's the narrow path. They're going to fail in that every time. 
And the problem is that the occupier put on so many things that you have to really address at one time against the presumptions that gives the power to the government that you just has it's just a line item state statement of fact to counter the presumption. You have to rebut the presumption and you have to bring the evidence. So that's just the added more thing. A letter puts you in the in the record that says they have a problem and you can't follow that presumption. And until this is resolved, you have no authority, whomever it is that you're, wants to talk to you. And I'm talking more of the official. The, the third-party man or woman on the street that wants to be uh, in your face, that's a little bit different, That's, but it's still the same. That's where you get down to where I was saying, if you, if you have to engage, you want to engage as little as possible, but are you my doctor? Are you my employer? Have you given me training to use the mask that you're importing? If, you, if the mask is so, it works so well, what are you worried about? Just wear your mask, that kind of stuff. Oh, and you have a point of education. You can have a, your bag of law, your bag of facts, and you just have things that you can hand out to people. Real short form. You can't make it complicated. Reduce entire passages down to a simple sentence and then give a citation with the quote. Uh, you hand people, did you know that masks can uh, create, if you don't do them, use them right, and you're not trained. I don't. I know you're not trained because you're using it here. That, that can be cause you sickness and death. Here's what 3M says about it. Here's what the CDC says about it. Short sentences. So you start giving an education as well as you're defending yourself. You you, you turn the, the, the point off from you and you move it over into the objective basis. And that what that does is that now neutralizes a lot of the attack. They're not going to change their attitude towards you, at least immediately. They're going to have their their internal fear on, but you're going to be able to buffer a lot of this, I would hope, with doing it this way. But getting into t- torn earth shaman, uh, has a big statement uh, here that he's uh, com- commented to me. Uh, thank you for passing the the uh, link around for, to listen. And you're right, we you can pass it around, but will that will people listen? That's something I don't know. Y- you can't force a lot of this stuff. This is I learned this a long time ago. It really is in the receiver. I transmit. Does anybody receive? Does any? Re- and the more important, do you receive? Then do you think about it, put it together for you, and then act. Do you perform an engagement that's going to protect you? That's where it's at. It's not even what, what you listening. So thank you for passing the, the, the information. All we can do is pass it around and hope it gets picked up. No different than you can pull out a, from an envelope here. You know, you're, you're making demands on me that you're trying, that you have no, no knowledge about. Here's some information. Once you read it, you know, maybe go tell it to someone who, who, who cares or whatever. I mean, it's probably not a good people to people contact, but anyway. So then he goes on to say that he's contacted a, uh, in his state uh, the various health authorities, and they've apparently sent him information, and he's going through it as he can. And this is what you have to do. You have to orient yourself with what's going on. And so that's important. And then there's a, a consideration, something based on Article 1 of the 13th Amendment strikes me, uh, that the federal and state governments have criminally overstepped their bounds and it's time to go on the offensive through law by compelling the government to enforce the constitution on itself well this is sort of what i've been saying although i don't you got to be careful here i am still consistently going to hold to the fact you don't want to go federal and i've got i've got some uh, court case in that uh, representative out of uh, i think it's well illinois i don't know i think it's illinois uh, the court came back, the federal court came back and said this very point and uh, had to make a decision on this. You don't, and it, it remands it back to the state. So I was saying at the time, I don't know how these state actions can be remanded to the federal government. This is critical. Why? Because the federal government treats you, the man, on the, man and woman on the street, as nothing compared to the relationship between the feds and the state arrangement. And they give deference to the state, unless you can show that's not what the case was. So I've got a case for that now. And so don't go to the federal. Don't respond at this point to the federal. This is a state thing. The, the health is actually a state responsibility. That's why you only see guidance and suggestion coming from the feds. This also points out when you look at your state that they're supposed to do the determination. They're not supposed to defer to a foreigner that's not on the ground right at the spot of contact, of outbreak. And so you have to understand how this is working against you. And I think when you understand that, you'll understand how much power you actually have to be someone that in substance steps forward in record and says, you've got some major problems here. And we stay in the state designations and we go to the state constitution. 
and I didn't go look to see whether or not the Article 1 and 13th Amendment uh, it strikes, uh, it could strike you to do that. I'd be careful on moving over to the federal side. I, I, right now, I can't see how it benefits anybody at this point. Not on this stuff. Now, there might be some extenuating things that go on, and that's good, but I don't want to broach that until we, I, I see more people actually understanding what they're dealing with, are competent in dealing with it, and can bring bring for themselves. They have a good start on things when a time I I see it, and, and that's what I'm seeing a failure. There's a not a very good start. People don't have a good comprehension, at least by my observations, on what has to be done. And so we have a long term of time here that I've noticed that we. I, I'm trying to get people to see the more proper, what I consider the more proper action. When I say more proper, for me, it's really pointing out the, here's what the black and white says. This is what you have to say to meet that. It's not my opinion why I'm saying what has to be done. It's saying this is the guidance given uh, the law that is going to be what the occupying officers and their agents have to follow. It's, you, we don't, I don't make any of this up what I think has to happen. And so we're looking for the evidence of the compliance, and that's what you're looking for. You're not asking. You're not going to. You're not going to ask a question of somebody. It's not actually uh, an open records request, even though it can come in that form. You want them to produce the evidence they complied with the law. And as I'm working with somebody, and that sets up in the absence of that, you set up the reliance. You're going to move forward in a remedy. Because they presume it's been done. The, the court will presume it's been done. Everybody acts as if it's been presumed to be done. And no one questions that it has been done. And so they, you can end that by saying, I, find, I can't find evidence. You need to produce it for me and very quickly. You know, I'm not going to give you the words for the letter. I would like to have you folks put up. It's only sentences that you're speaking here. And uh, therefore, I want, without you presenting the evidence you have complied, I'm going to rely that you have it. And so you set your condition up. Those are quick fact statements that you put together. This is how you will approach every one of your problems, actually. And this is why I want to focus on this. This is hurting everybody. I get to talk to everybody. Why not everybody listening today is pretty fascinating to me when they're all complaining about how the problems are. They're fighting amongst each other now. They'd rather fight. This is, I tell you, we're not a good, people aren't pretty good amongst themselves. And so, there's, I don't know what more to do with that. And so, again, so Tom, yeah, be careful on moving this to the federal. Go back into your state laws. The agencies won't tell you anything. The statutes are what you go to to mix, to find out what the state, the agencies are going to supposed to do, whether that's the state, federal, the state, excuse me, the state health authority or your local. And there's a delegation of authority that goes through. You can use that both ways as well. Once you start working on this, your mind focusing on this instead of everything else, you should be able to start to see what the positions are and what you're looking for. It's not a lot. It's just that they've simply complied. You want evidence that they've complied with what's going on. Now, if there's no evidence, then what are you going to do with that? See, that's the next step. That's where you choose your remedy. What do you want to do with it? So I've been went to the habeas because people were going to be drawn out and using your quarantine as an unwarranted uh, restraint on your liberty. That seemed natural. The burden flips on that. And so not only do you come in and say, I don't, I don't see any evidence, they have, the, the, they have to produce it. Or they're going to get a license by the judge, the bar association. You have to close that door as well. Uh, we, I won't talk about that too much until we you get interested to start writing things and then want to know whether or not you've done it or you figured it out. I mean, there's a, it's, they've got us in a way that you really do have to pay attention to how you respond, at least in my estimation. And again, not on my opinion of that, that it's there. The courts will go a certain way. It's like knowing when you go to the federal court, they're not going to determine your, your case by justice or law. It goes by authorities and jurisdictions and presumptions. And most people don't understand how to shut all those doors. And I'm going to show you one evidence that the, a magistrate, federal magistrate judge, noticed that. Just what I told you. I said, I don't understand how this can be remanded if it's a state case. He noticed that it was only a state case, even though he tried to drag, he had to consider whether or not federal code, uh, federal rights were invoked. And a very interesting insight. You need to read that. I'll have you the link for you here. 
after a while that uh, he toner Sharman says uh, uh, this uh, CV19 is the only latest ongoing treason by many in government. It's time to demand the restoration of our constitutional republic. Well, that's been my message here. It's we the people that were vigilant to stop it. I've offered plenty of ways to do that. And I think in what I believe to be much more fu uh, fundamental, foundational, powerful ways that apparently confounds people, which shows just how far away we are from ma re uh, keeping the republic, let alone restoring it. And so we don't have the how do we kept the republic and we're trying to restore it. We may have been in a, in a problem for ourselves. Yes, the treason can be found in lots of places. It's that occupation for many levels and, and ways. And if you accept that the courts justified Lincoln's usurpation, that's what we've been living under as well. But we've got to find something to go after. I thought COVID would do it. I realized it would affect everybody. I figured that would be the impetus to get everybody in on it and coming together to work it out. And I, I've been wrong uh, at this point. There's some, a few of you, but I've, I've been wrong generally. And so don't go to Vegas and take my advice. That's for sure. That that one's for sure. Everything else I think you can uh, is objectively determined. You just go to the statute. I tell you, you see the duty. They should, that means the duty was it's presumed they've done that. And you walk in and say, but I don't see evidence of it. And that, that ev the lack of that evidence means if you can't produce it, you don't have an authority that you're promoting. And so you've gotten two of the most powerful thing, uh, weapons they use against you to, taken away from them. The presumption that the law has been followed and that the sovereign has, has, a, has prerogative. They do as long as you don't question it. And a simple letter can start to do that for you. For those of you that are are interested to defend yourself, and it's coming down uh, um, about how that works. Let me listen. Let me uh, play, play a quick little video here. It just came out, and I want to have you hear this guy. I call Noisome Newsom out of California, governor. He wants to tell you, oh, how uh, how warm and fuzzy he is that you're helping him uh, defeat you, uh, and uh, you're and that he really doesn't have any power here. And I want you to hear this because you need to hear a couple things. I'm just going to hit it and run. You need to hear what these people will do to get you to believe that they're um, they're family, that they're you're helping the world, that they have something to help, that they're doing you a favor. Here it's only 17 seconds of it. It's a news thing. Listen carefully. And so let me thank all of you for your continuation uh, of the theme to wear face coverings, to practice the social distancing, the physical distancing, uh, and please, in closing. Um, again, I can't mandate anything. I can only help influence. Okay, so so this guy, he says your face covering mandate is a uh, a theme. Did you get that? I hope you heard that. If not, maybe on the, on, when I do the post broadcast, it'll be the volume may come up. I at any rate, it's a theme, right? And he says you got to understand this is a governor. He's essentially the president of a country. When it comes to martial law, he can declare martial law. He can impose martial law. This thing, this guy doesn't have the power to impose what he is underneath the collar of something else. But he's going to tell you and stand there and tell you that the, thank you for following the theme that he has no power to mandate, uh, but to influence. Well, influence is just like saying threat. So to me, when I heard that, just that, uh, the threat influences threat and they threaten you with violation harms fines and all this so this is not a hollow influence that's a threat a system of government that rules by threat intimidation or dread is a terrorist and doing terrorism go back to the point of the uh, he can, can't mandate let's take that and let's take that for his word he's not he can't mandate well there's either if he can't who can and so this is your delegation of authority kicking in it may not be him who who gets the the actual word. He must look, look down the line and your statutes will point is that there's a health authority delegated the, the responsibility and duty, more importantly, to do certain things to inform him. The problem is they've all the governors have split this point, whether it's a health authority or whether it's just a general emergency. And in one state, I just now come across that they don't even have under a general emergency. It does not stay state epidemic. They don't even have an authority in a general emergency in one state. And yet that's what they've been using. And so you then, okay, you can out that, and then you turn over to your, now the standard by which they were supposed to del, um, 
the delegated power was supposed to act, and that's where you go local to you because that's how they do the epidemic. They have to find an outbreak of a thing local. They actually, most states tell you that there's a patient, they'll have to check on that. So you're looking for the evidence on the fact that, that that's, those rules or statutes have been complied with. Not you, the government. That's before it starts making mitigation. But when you get into mitigation, you hear that the masks are just a theme. How'd you like that, folks? But he can't mandate, he says. So you go ahead and take that lead. He can't mandate, then what's his threats to you? You point that out, and then you go down the train, the, 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 the path of the chain of title of authority, and you see what they were supposed to do before they can act. And that's why I say your question is, where's the evidence you did the, you verified that there was an infectious agent? And you may find that not as the infectious agent where they mention communicable disease. That's two parts. The disease, which they call COVID in this case, and the communicable or transmissible agent for that. It's not a car without gas. It's got a car called COVID. And you've got the model called COVID and it has the, the fuel you put in it is this, in, this agent that they claim is a presumed thing. Well, they can, everybody, as governments move on presumption. You have to rebut that. It's not that difficult, what all I'm saying here. It's just it seems to be com convoluting it for people. But I, I, I've been trying to find out ways. Let's get at this. He says he can't mandate it. I would agree in one regard. Let's go to the delegated powers and see if they've fulfilled those. And why is he even speaking if they haven't got an infectious agent they're protecting for? And since you use this, oh, well, you can't do a mandate, you can influence. How are you influencing? You can't influence by fraud, and I won't let you. And then you're going you're gonna to see the real animal come out when you start to do that. But if you know that, you get ready to respond to the beast that will come from that. And that's the fun part, because now you're playing it's mouse and cat and mouse at some point. You've got this, and you'll get it understood. You've got this. You'll, you'll actually find they won't respond to you, and if you don't look for a statement to the, from them, and you just go by the statute and looking for the evidence, when they don't answer, you just you just rely that it doesn't exist. And this is on when you're taking a remedy that you have the burden. Under the habeas, you could say the same thing, but it's already their burden to produce. And so you have a double whammy, if you will, that way. And I'm not saying, okay, everybody's case and everybody's psychology about how they want to approach this is different. So I've been kind of limiting it to the more simple stuff. It, Depending on what you have in you that you really want to do, we'll see how you have to develop this. But it all starts right now relative to the imposition of mandates and mandatory vaccines that this uh, governor says he has no mandate, he can only influence. If he can only influence, then what's all the penalties? That's what you would present. There's no, if he claims there's no influence that he can present that causes a penalty. And this is after you've identified that there's no mitigation measure because they don't have, there is no test for the infectious agent. In fact, if you look carefully, this PCR, and I've failed to actually point this out. I've, it's there, and I, I thought it was more important than the other one, but I'm starting to see now people are going to need all kinds of things. The PCR will test and replicate all kinds of genetic dentrists in the body system. It's so it's really, that's the other part of it. It, it. There may not be nothing in your body relative to this, but it's because of the, it's not really a, a clinical tool. It's just to replicate any DNA you have in a sample. And in a, in a research facility, they're usually dealing with a pure strain from that side, from the source side. They know what they're dealing with. The, they don't know in the public what they're dealing with. It's like looking in two directions. That the, the PCR, it'll throw all kinds of stuff because it's just looking at what's in your system. And so moving on here, one of the, so he has the thank you for the mask theme and this and all. And uh, we have uh, someone who pointed out a CDC website. So you want us to do the authorities. You know, I got my broadcast was banned uh, on uh, on YouTube because they claim that I'm counter to the uh, official narrative. The official narrative, but I'm not. I read right from their documents. Like this uh, note. This is irrespective. We're talking about here relative to this COVID and relative to mask use and the public guidance for community related exposure. Remember that community word. That's what's underlying this whole thing. It's communitarianism is one word. It's a so sustainable development. That when they have community-based anything, you're sitting in a foreign imposition. So don't miss that on the title of that document that I don't think Sound Minds has. Sorry, uh, I got that way too late. It came off the Twitter from uh, Barman. 
I think on a on an automatic present presentation that uh, this link says on the for CDC that this community guideline this is irrespective relative to the PCR test and positive. This is a, and and who would be testing positive irrespective of whether the person with COVID nineteen or the contact was wearing a mask or whether the contact was wearing respiratory personal protective equipment. And then going on down to the double asterisk, you can read, and I don't, I don't know if I should read it. It just takes a long time to read. Let me get to the bottom of it. Therefore, a conservative approach, the determination of close contact should generally be irrespective of whether the contact was wearing respiratory PPE, which is recommended for healthcare personnel and other trained users or a mask recommended for the general public. Well, there is no mask actually recommended because you're supposed to be trained and they're in the capacity to do something in employment. And we've read all that and we read, read the manufa- at least 3M's product data sheet that says if you improperly use these things, they'll call you sickness. They'll cause sickness and death. And they're not, and this website, uh, CDC, won't, in, is omitted to inform you of that relative to the general public. And so there's a whole lot of, like I said, look for the omissions, but you have to be read in this to understand this dynamic to see how they're taking you down and that's exactly how the anomalies is what you're going to be using as i've told you over and over again what you bring out to show the deception for you how it's working against you stop looking for everybody else would you please i've been looking so many people say well everybody's not acting everybody else won't care won't listen it doesn't matter what they do it's it's you being chased by a bear all you have to do is run just faster than the next guy. Okay? So that's what this is like. You stop what the other guy won't do. You better be doing what you need to be doing. Don't put it off on everybody's inaction. That's just you being part of the herd. And I anyway, get back. I get irritated about this a bit, I guess, because it's hurting people. It's killing y'all. So anyway, what you have right off of this site, he wants to say, oh, thank you for the theme of mask wearing. Yeah, there's no protection at all. There's not even telling you that this can cause sickness and health by the manufacturer. They're not even tell you that there's nothing that it's irres- They're going to test irrespective of you mask wearing. So you want more proof? This is what you put in to show the anomalies underneath the suggestion. I'm suggesting, though, you hold that off until after you've showed the failure to comply with the law and you get to the then the in, uh, arbitrary and capriciousness of any mitigation measure, and then you show this is a proof. You just cite the quote, and then you cite it to the website that you're getting it from, and cite it to the CDC authority. And you start to show that their failure to do the first step is a the second the mitigation measure co- problems as a consequence of that, and they're they're actually doing things that doesn't matter. They're telling us to do things that don't matter. And so the other thing and a side thing about that is if they haven't done the determination, they're putting everybody and you particularly, each one of you at risk because they haven't identified if they think there's something out there that you can't see. And they're the so-called expert. Now you could see they're presumed to be the expert. Uh, They're the so-called expert. They're missing the mark. They're putting me in danger by not knowing. And so this is another aspect of that. So what I'm saying is you fo- you look at every point you can to, to take away the, the the presumption that they're knowing anything. And you heard that in one of the one or two of the court cases. The court said it's not in the position that it needs to be that the executive is and has the expertise to make these calls. There was the statement to you, if you didn't hear it said before or didn't understand it, that you have a presumption to rebut. And I'm explaining a little bit. Your letter is written to do that. It's not long-winded here. It's focused strictly on making sure, again, the evidence is produced in the absence of your ability to see where the evidence it is, where is the evidence that they've done step one, because they're doing stuff the CD says is irrespective of any any um, outcome, irrespective of anything that they look at that would give them information, that would give an expert something to put their teeth into to make a statement. So you're also proving that they have no, the experts have no sources. And that's why I say point out all the, any studies you have as a consequence to inform a court or even, I don't know if I'd want to do the government agencies because that's the, that's who you want to shut down for the future. The courts are kind of tagged onto the side of that. So you don't want to kind of get you don't want to get in a battle trying to explain to a local administrator about this either. You just want to see if they've complied with the law for what they're doing. That's all. 
for the court and for a remedy, then you bring out, you may be required to bring out these things that show the anomalies, showing that the experts say themselves they don't know, they say it numerously, and then they respond through that ignorance to do these things, which the manufacturer of the device they're saying says it's going to cause sickness and, and death, and so they're going to cause sick, potentially cause sickness and death without a proper purpose, because I'm not a, I'm not a surgeon, or, or I'm not in a position to be trained, or it's not it's irrespective using it's irrespective of the potential to have a positive outcome which means nothing relative to the infectious agent they're going to cause me to do something in balance which is more deadly to me potentially than just walking around like i have for all my life exposing myself to the common cold and the flu and they're not they're not supposed to do that that's another point and moving on here virginians to face mandatory covid vaccination, uh, will they resist? Here we have the word resist, he's popping up. Uh, who's next? Will they resist? It doesn't matter. Are you going to resist? And then how? No one who says this will give you an op will give you a solution at all. Well, it's like, excuse me, the work solution's too strong. We'll give you an option in order to protect yourself and make the record. And I have a, because I hold, because I hold the idea, if it's just an idea, which you've heard me prove more than an idea, that you're in a state of control in a systematic way, why a lot of you who've been entered in and got beat up won't engage again. But those of you that don't know this, because of that, there's in a way nothing you can do, but you can for yourself make the record. Then you can get together with others that make the record, and pretty soon you build your numbers with foundational information, not your opinion about how it ought to be. And, and totally un mis not understanding what you're up against. Virginians to face mandatory COVID vaccination. This is not even new news. What I'm saying here, it Virginia, you're next. Of a many, many states, you're next. And I and so uh, th this is where, where you're going to have to come up. How are they going to come up with COVID vaccination when the state hasn't identified? I know health authority has certified to an infectious agent or the transmiss determine the transmission mode. Simple question, which is really the, you're looking for evidence, produce the evidence of them both. You're not asking a question or a, a really a document production. You're saying in the absence of the production of the evidence that complied with the law, you rely on the fact they didn't for your remedy. You, you don't hang it out to go on and on and on about di dialoguing with these folks that are violating you. And so... Virginia's on, on facing mandatory like every other state. What I am telling you to do would be your record to get in the face of that and prop more properly so. And if you don't, if you keep talking about it, this is coming on you. They're telling you this is on you. It is becoming increasingly obvious the COVID-19 pandemic is being used as a propaganda ploy to empower government to seize control and the most elemental life choices of America. And then the next statement would be from most anybody, and you got to resist this, folks. you got to resist. But they don't offer anything. I'm telling you exactly how you do it. And until I get enough people that we see what the government does around that, I don't know really what more to say until we initiate that counter. It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what everybody's doing. It matters what you are doing. Any one of you. Yeah, I can read on and on. It's really ridiculous. The point is the news is more states are coming with mandatory vaccines. They're actually moving this mandatory nature of idea into just the flu vaccine, which shows you the expanding mission, mission creep, if you will. Your, your job, your mission, if you choose to take it to protect yourself, is to identify they don't have a mission because they haven't identified the infectious agent, which is required in your statute or rule or by whatever method they say in that state. It's already written down. A court has ruled the Connecticut's governor and public health commissioner have broad authority to force residents into involuntary quarantines. Involuntary quarantines. We didn't think this is going to get serious. So if you don't have an on record, and this may not even stop one where they pick you up, as I told you they would. Here we go, 9-11. Indefinite detention for those considered to be a, a criminal. In this case, presumptively by presumption, if you don't get how they worked all this, how easy it is to cut through it. Connecticut can now 
given been given license by the bar association based on how the case that the court got in order to impose upon people that are deemed to be potentially contagious. Now, the important part about this case it had to do with Ebola. And this happened to be done in 2014, so it's not just now. And you have to look and see what the court did and notice that it was a federal court that m dismissed the case against the state. The federal court dismissed the suit against the state and the appeals court agreed Friday, concluding, among the other things, the state quarantine laws do not violate clearly established constitutional rights. Listen to very carefully what the argument answer was, whether or not that's what they argued and that's what the answer was. Is that correct? Would you go and argue that the quarantine laws do not do not that the quarantine laws are violative of clearly established constitutional rights? I hope you said no. I hope you said no. We're going to use those quarantine laws. We're not going to argue that they're unconstitutional or they violate our rights. We're going to say that they provide a due process. What we're actually saying, and we'll confine our argument to, is where's the evidence you confined yourself to the compliance with that state law for quarantine? What does that mean? They just don't quarantine. They have to go through this process I told you first before they can quarantine. So the little thing here is, apparently the court believed, and it wasn't held uh, different, by anybody that the state quarantine laws were challenged for their violating constitutional rights. I'm telling you, and I have been telling you, those things are there to protect your rights. It's the violation to them that you're attacking. And the way you do that is not argue that it's a violation. You show where they don't have evidence they've complied with those due process protecting statutes. And the consequence of which is the violation to your state law constitutional rights and other privileges if you're inside statutory privilege. Okay, so the, look very carefully at this decision. Decision. This is how they parse this thing out. If you, you miss the trick on this one, the attorneys argued the wrong thing. The court came back with the right answer and everybody says, oh, the state has a complete, complete right to invoke quarantine for even people that are not showing any symptoms. In this case, for Ebola, there was a line of authorities that I don't have a time to go look at that likely were pretty pretty well comported to. That's not the case for COVID. But they will do this to you. They, this is the point about this, this report. Connecticut is going to go on this presumption that, they, that your argument challenges the constitutionality of their process, and that's not what you're doing. What you're doing is looking for the evidence they've complied with that process. And there's one statute in every state that gives the duty to do that, and probably more. There's probably I read it last week. After every comma, there's a condition that you have to qualify, and within those commas are may or may not be the duties that they're supposed to do. And you have to extract those and list those, copy and paste. No making up anything, no opinions. You're just saying, here's the due process. We're not going to challenge that that the legislature make made this made this procedure for these this particular subject matter, epidemic, communicable disease, its prevention. We're going to go ahead and agree that's good enough. We're not going to challenge that. What we're char challenging, because we find no evidence, is whether or not the government complied, the government officials or agents or experts complied with that. And we're finding, as I, I found early on, when? February? They are not. And it's been universal all this time. And so here we move. We move. Connecticut's going to say uh, you can now quarantine everybody. They're going to run on that presumption because the federal court said so. And that wasn't for you. That was between the relationship between the feds and the state. Presuming the laws have been followed and the government has the right. The people who sued that Ebola case did not refute that presumption in one little bit. And then the court said, well, they were claiming that these, this process violates my constitutional rights. In fact, it doesn't. In fact, it protects you. It's the violation to the due process by the government, not following it, that's the violation. So now we move into another report here in Massachusetts. Those of you that around the country, you're going to, this week is going to go through the states here. 
flu vaccine now required for all Massachusetts students by December 31st. Now, this is the flu vaccine because they say they don't want to do a double COVID problem anticipating uh, next year. Well, that just admits their mitigation measures for this year and the, and the, and the common cold were not applicable, first of all, and not, not sufficient because why? They don't understand the infectious agent. That they're already telling you by doing that, that they, their mitigation measures are in, are improper, arbitrary, and capricious, number one. Number two, they're now mandating a flu vaccine. If you now read also, you'll understand, if you read enough, uh, not too much actually, because it's coming out more and more. The, the, the injection of any vaccine brings you more susceptible to what they claim is COVID. You don't have this word in your mouth to refute this supposed authority of the properness of the compliance with the laws. They're going to take you out. You claim your rights are being violated in the first instance instead of saying that they com- haven't complied, you're going to lose. You just heard that last case. I don't even have to discuss it more. But now it's moving from ooh, a common cold vaccine that's going to be totally, well, it's ir- improper to begin with, but totally destructive into now forcing students, again, look at the limit the authority, to have to get the flu vaccine, setting them up for a future problem in many ways, and and completely disregarding each individual son or daughter that you have, whether or not there's a, a medical condition or whether or not, which they might say that you don't have to, but the pressure becomes to go ahead and give it. And then what have we heard they do? They They cut your son and daughter from the herd. They treat them different. So what's the answer there? Don't send them to school. I, I can't believe that people are still wanting to send their, their sons and daughters to school anymore. But anyway, that's not for me to say. Massachusetts, they're going to expand the COVID vaccine mandate to flu, regular seasonal flu, which not even is on the table, but they're going to make it so. Uh, there's another doctor here that's come out. I'll give you a link uh, on a go file. I won't listen. Uh, it play, uh, play it. It's in uh, Italian. An Italian doctor that outs this whole thing on his own and tell, tells the Italians, watch out, this is what's coming down. He lays it out. He lays out, I think, 99% of what I have, uh, maybe 95. He might, I don't even know if he adds more, but I'll say maybe he adds 5% more, uh, explaining exactly what I have on how this lays out, what's been going on, and you you can hear it. You have to read subtitles, and which is not really so bad. You can take notes. What am I offering this for? Outside of the CDC and the WHO, Doctors everywhere are finding a different reality. That's not something that you start with in your letter. You first just want evidence that they've compor- the government's comported with the law, complied with the law. Once you see where your remedy goes, you're going to bring this this kind of a thing as an alternative that was not discussed or viewed by the so-called health foreign health authority to the local. And the local didn't either. And so you, you show that there's a, after you've developed your, your, your case or you, you develop your position, you then show how they, the, they didn't take that hard look. As you do, and we do this administratively. They didn't take the hard look at what all was involved and available. In other words, they went right to vac- damaging vaccine instead of finding out and, de- and then denying hydroxychloroquine in the face of international recognition, even the who, not the rock group. I don't think they did a song called hydroxychloroquine or, or an owl, but the, the World Health Organization, they even agreed that it's the unit. Go look to the hydroxychloroquine wiki page. It says right there it's like universal since the 40s or 50s when it got brought in. And then the imposition by someone who has only influence power in noisome newsom will, he says, admits to you that he's also getting inside your, the, doctor-patient relationship. Uh, but the go file here, uh, and I got through a link, you can listen to the doctor from Italy explaining the fraud, explaining the condition, giving you a, an alter- alternative exposure to an expert in the field who's having to deal with it. And again, not presented as the uh, as an argument, presented as a counter-proof of the failure of the local authority to take more things into consideration before they went and violated your state rights and your state due processes on matters that are unwarranted based on the fact there is no test, which turn underneath the penal statutes of the state into felonies, where they affect you in a property, 
It's extortion or a right, and a right of pertinent property is coercion, unwarranted in an official capacity. Those are crimes. And then you've got con official conversion of all that as well. Not your federal rights, which you'll, we'll get here soon that they, you've got to look at carefully. They kind of back up to each other, and that's one of the problems. You have to clearly delineate what you're speaking of. I've been focusing you all, all on state, your state authorities, so that we will avoid the federal vacuum cleaner that the uh, we found Illinois' uh, governor using. I told you this before. Selective and cross. So here we have a go file says the doctor. We have a guy, uh, a doctor in Italy, explaining to the Italians, watch out. We have what? We also have that interview from that Spanish doctor, outing it the same way. These are experts, counter experts you bring, and you don't bring them as a counter expert. You show that after you've developed, there is no test, that you've developed mitigation strategies were arbitrary and capricious, and the continuation of this thing shows that. You also show doctors that are explaining, then now you bring in the evidence in a short summary statement uh, that the, uh, there's evidence of doctors now ra realizing that's the case because there's nothing working. And there's no evidence of anything. And that's where you bring in to support that. It's like you're having witness, supporting witness, supporting witness in your ca in your position of this, the descending steps of cons consequence. So, and so we move on now with another, another thing that has never been, and I, and I broached this a few weeks ago, so it's interesting how this comes on. They weren't talking about it. I picked up, I think, the very first day, within days, that Indian doctor talking about it. And now it's becoming more and more in the news. I told you this is what you use as one of the other tests that they haven't done, which may mitigate what they have to do as remedy that hasn't been looked at. And this is that T-cell condition. Serolective and cross-reactive SARS-CoV-2 T-cell uh, epitopes in unexposed humans. A short, uh, okay, abstract. Many, unknown, many unknowns exist about human immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 virus. Many unknowns exist about animal immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 virus. There's an unknown, many unknowns. So if there's unknowns, this is a study that says they admit there's unknowns in the experts, what is being relied on by the local state official? But when their duty was to find exactly what's going on. SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells have been reported in unexposed individuals suggesting pre-existing cross-reactive T-cell memory in 20 to 50% of the people. Let me just interject. The, the Princess Cruz Petri dish suggests 70 to 80. But at any rate, let's go by this. They're saying that unexposed individuals show T-cell immunity. Remember I brought that up, what the importance of this was. Not PCR antibodies. This is where the body's been fighting something, and it's, it's ready to go. It either jumps on this thing so quick and, and keeps it from getting anywhere. It deals with those enzyme payload, chemical weapon uh, de deposition, or it, it can handle it fast enough that you take a little bit of symptoms. You've got what they call almost asymptomatic. You're dealing with it, but your body's handling it because it's immune from it. Why? And they're going to find out here it's exactly what you would have thought. It's the way, as I've said it, human, the little animals that you are, how they treat you, underneath also Title 50, and your pesticides, and the bacteriological agents, and all this stuff, the humans that you is, that you continue to stay in that status without stepping up and saying, no, no, you can't treat me like this. Their bodies uh, are being found to be resistant in a natural way, and therefore, if they're resistant, then you can negate the go-to of vaccines, can't you? And so you start building this, this pile of evidence for yourself in a concise way, you're going to have the bag of law you need to protect yourself. No one else is going to do this for you. Leading back to the article here. However, the source of the T cells has been speculative. Can I read that again? The source of the T cells has been speculative. How many times can I read that and smile and have you all smile? In ignorance, and now it's speculative. We lose the objective basis for it. There's no science. It still exists, but they don't know the cause. Showing you they don't know the system that's going on here. And that's fine. We could learn, but not for the point when you get an executive who just wants to influence you by denying he can mandate an injection to poison you and corrupt your blood, literally now, and your heirs and their abilities with something that's not safe or tested 
or even needed because they can't, there is no test. Okay, I've interrupted this. I go in to read through. Can't. This stuff is so clearly a violation. I don't know why more people aren't really stepping up with the concise short statements about it. But let me move over back to this. Using human blood samples derived before the SARS-CoV-2 virus was discovered in 2019, we mapped 142 T-cell epitopes across the SARS-CoV-2 genome to facilitate precise interrogation of the SARS-CoV-2-specific CD4 T-cell repertoire. We demonstrate a range of pre-existing memory CD4 T-cells that are cross-reactive with a comparative affili- comparable affinity to SARS-CoV-2 and the common cold coronaviruses HCoV-OC43, HCoV-292E, HCoV-NL63, and HCoV-HKU1. There's four of them. This is just in the family in the class. Your body fights off common colds. Why it's common, why it doesn't affect you so much. You're watching your system in a common cold reaction, watching your body perform perfectly. And this SAR, so-called SAR, unprovable, no test, is considered a presumed to be part of this, this whole issue. And they're finding that because of the common cold, you already have a T-cell defense in your system. 20 to 50% by this study. Prince's Petri dish example, possibly up to 80. Why I was mentioning all this stuff for you early, early on. Thus, variegated T-cell memory and coronaviruses that cause the common cold may underlie at least some of the extensive heterogeneity observed in COVID-19 disease. COVID-19 disease, not infectious agent. Notice that. Now, I won't read any more. Here's evidence that the, which, how you use this. Again, I'm not really talking the news or look at what we, how, you know, how much I'm telling you the truth of it. Look at what the new information is. I'm saying this is what the government ought to have been using to find out whether what. We used the word before, and it's coming up again, whether or not you're actually susceptible. They're not doing that test to limit what, then they're supposed to limit that authority to what it's supposed to be about. Their authority is about stopping epidemic and to the man or woman, actually. And so without that, at least at this point, a T-cell check to see whether or not you have the ability, potential to stop it, their mitigation measures are completely out of out of limit. They don't have a way to, to lim, limit what they're doing, and yet there's a test to do so. You bring that up as one of the final statements when you're going to show, even if you if we gave them that the, there is no test, we gave them that they don't even know how it transmits, even if we give them the mitigation measures all up to that point, the one that goes to vaccines, the ones that goes into trans, that we talked about infecting the, the asymptomatic problem, which we find out is not a problem, even the labs have a problem under PCR, we heard from that one clin- head clinician. You haven't looked to see the susceptibility element in all of this to limit how well your authority goes. Now, you couple that up with the mandate for flus, when we have evidence that the, taking another vaccine actually enhances this, whatever symptoms or attribu- whatever the symptoms are that the infectious agent is attributed to. You enhance that you're actually making the wrong decision as, a, as an official body. You now have the power to explain that in one sentence. Now, there's a lot we've been talking about. When you sit down and organize this stuff up, I've been telling you, broadcast by broadcast, it should lay out fairly well what you have available to say. And that's another thing. I'm not trying to say anything for you. I'm giving you all the tools you have to defend yourself. We now have the best evidence yet that everyone develops long-term coronavirus immunity after infection, and it's not just about anybody's. How killer of a decision, a title is that? It's not just about anybody's. And this goes on to talk about another report on the T-cells. Okay, so this is, when I brought up, I said, this looks like it's going to be the limit of this. They're not testing for it. It addresses the susceptibility element that's a part of all this relative to their mitigation measures, we're now getting more information from more doctors, more studying that's going on, not just some opinion that just in the ether, that this story talks in the same way. Their their look is a little bit different. I'll go through some of the head points. Some early studies have suggested coronavirus antibodies fade relatively quickly 
But that doesn't mean immunity vanishes. Well, this is not talking T-cells now. At this point, this was talking about the theory that there was going to be, because the, T the PCR was so inaccurate and in irrelevant, it was throwing these positives out that made it look like you were infected. And so immunity was vanishing, correct? It's not. And they weren't looking at the T cell. And that's what the introduction of the Indian doctor was. And now we're seeing more and more coming out. Like I told you, this is going to become important. And I, the way you use it becomes very important because that's what you throw down on your letter. How did you, let me evidence that you investigate and do investigate and test for T cells that prove immunity in someone relative to susceptibility. Explain, give me the evidence you've found, sought, a limit on the extent of your mitigation measures, if we allow you any. Uh, going on, a new study found the participant infected with COVID-19, even with uh, asymptomatic or mild cases in patients who di didn't have detectable antibodies, developed virus-specific T cells. This is a totally different study than the other one I just talked about. T cells identify and kill infected cells, and B cells create new antibodies. The, those cells can attack the virus if it ever returns. And I want to understand, I, want to, I started to get lost a bit about, I started to actually believe this is alive. This is not, a, a virus is not alive. So let's remind ourselves of that. This is a chemical payload. And so this genome that they're talking about is kind of spacious to begin with, but, but it's, an, it's an affected cell by this payload that they're actually checking. And moving on here on this story, more T cell evidence. I'm saying you use the failure of the of the agency to tell you they have evidence they've used it as a failure of the agency to actually look at the condition and to find out where the limit of the authority was and that they're going to extend measures upon people that and you just claim it yourself without taking a test. Do not take a test. In fact, that Italian doctor will tell you, do not take the test. That's the door. He doesn't say it this way. It's the way I, way I would tell you. That opens the door for Dracula. Do not take the test. As I said in an email, in a Twitter, you have a right not to incriminate yourself. Where they're look, where they're a hammer looking for nails, you want, don't want to incriminate yourself. And then you can throw this T cell because that test doesn't test whether you're susceptible. And that's not the end of it, but this is for this one. I'm, so, I'm showing you, you take the information you have and how to use it, not sit there and, and bob your head in, in understanding, oh, there's a T cell, oh, it's immunity. No, these people are coming after you, and they intend to come after you. Uh, T cell identif T identify, T cells identify and kill infected cells. So we have this system that goes after these cells that are affected by the chemical payload, the toxic chemical payload that will clean things up. And if it's engaged, if it's there, then it's going to help clean things up. It's going to mitigate the response you have, maybe even to asymptomatics. You are not necessarily infectious, but your body is, is dealing with it. It's just how your life, your, your, your whole existence has, has adapted to this, this state. Your immune system has done this. It's actually what they're not also saying is likely what happened as more and more sickness came on the world in the turn of the century, the 1900s into the, into going into, you know, through the middle 1900s, immune systems of people were having to fight this stuff. And the ones that survived were the ones that started to, to spread that, that, that syst that systemic immunity with them. And so that's when also the, the medicine stepped in and took advantage of that natural healing that was, and, 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 protection that was going on and claimed that their medicine, their vaccines were, were viable. They were just riding off the cover of that. But T cells identify and kill infected cells. So we have a system that does that. Our, it has a local jurisdiction looked at that as a potential help to mitigate. No, they can't because there is no test. And if they did, they might find out that they don't have the job they need to because when we, if we look at the Princess Petri, just you've already got 80% of the societies immune from the common cold as far as an epidemic level. So you got that standard they have to meet. It's a communicable disease that it's not already agreed to being common or seasonal. Seasonal. So the new finding is strong evidence that a patient's likely develop long-term immunity. Perfect. So we'll give you the link to that. 
I think that I read that story, so I didn't have to go through the the article in that abstract. It says the same stuff. We have a Dover test, another test. You'll use it to say you're to find out whether or not they are looking that they have identified a susceptibility test. And I would say I need the evidence of that that you're using that, and then you're finding out whether they're ignorant of it because you bring that in later, but whether they're already using it or know about it. You just ask in the general. Now we're getting on to the lawsuit. As I say, you have to step up. People are going to have to step up to defend themselves. Somebody did happen to be a representative out of Clay County. I think this was Illinois, yes. Uh, the controversial lawsuit, I don't know why it's controversial unless the government and the media here it wants you uh, dead. But the controversial lawsuit between uh, Representative Darren Bailey in, from Xenia, a Republican, and Governor J.B. Pritzker have rega- has regained momentum. Both parties have waited for weeks for a decision on where the case would continue. U.S. Magistrate Judge Gilbert Sisson remanded the case back to Clay County on Monday. This is immense. This is what I was telling you when I saw this case. I, Pritzker was moving them to the federal court. He'd won two before because of the relationship is looked at and the presumption that the power sits in the government to, that it's done everything correctly and it would dismiss every every case against the, the those two cases against Illinois. This one is very critical because apparently the attorney amended his com- his original complaint. The court looked had to look at the amended complaint, and the attorney, by the, I'll just tell you, by the skin of his teeth, was able to obscure and make a question as to whether Bailey was actually referring to federal rights, because the court and did the analysis. Of whether or not it was clear that Bailey, in this case, is found to not be invoking federal rights, the federal court magistrate said, I can't take the case, we'll remand it back, and it'll be a state court case. That's exactly what I told you when I read the case. I didn't understand how the, because when I read the case, I was looking at it that it looked strictly like a state law case. This is the first magistrate that actually made that analysis. And when he did the analysis, like your local health authority is supposed to do the analysis, do the certification on what is. And understanding the federal jurisdictional door is actually closed and you have the burden of opening it. The judge decides that there was no actual federal claims made, closed, keeps the door closed and said, I'm going to remand this back to the state. Very interesting analysis. You want to talk about the funny word called jurisdiction and whether it's there or not and why I focus on it? This is the case that will help you possibly understand why I limit everything right now relative to a health issue to the state. So the representative is not going to suffer the consequence of other two people because even the attorney inartfully argued the case the judge did not find that there was any specific act invoked on the federal side that he then said, okay, that since there's no alternative act invoked by the statement, there's nothing that the state, uh, there's nothing that the feds offer that the state already does because they match and they're not, there's nothing prevailing. The state law is the court of jurisdiction, of competency. And so you, You hear why I've been saying to you, keep your state law stuff state. Do not claim federal rights. Find them in your stat, in your constitution, what I've I've told you. So this court case is pretty neat that way. I still don't like any of it. It shouldn't even be there. But here we are. We're going to have to take what we can and, and what we can and utilize those points. I want, again, I'd like, I can't read this stuff. It takes a long time to read it. But you need to see that black and white of how this thing works to read it about how this is all worked out. I think this is also the dis- discussion where it shows you that those of you that want to start doing your court papers better, it shows you that you don't just claim a right, but you have to develop that you have the right. And uh, now let's, whether that's federal or state. And so when you don't, you leave it open for the discernment of the judge. In this case, he's pointing out that the amended complaint wasn't really very clear about which rights it was invoking. But the conversation in the case 
looked like it wasn't going outside the bounds of state law. And so while this was a close one, the court, I thought, when you look at the balance of what was argued relative, even when they look, you look through the question, I didn't think it was a question. When you talk about the, in this case, he even mentions the right to travel. Did I peek, peek some ears? <laughs> he mentions the right to travel. He tells you there's a court case that he could refer to. I think this is the case. I'm trying to look at it now. I thought I had it marked. Oh, that's right. It's over in the case law. Well, I, maybe I'll run over there and read that now. Let me move this through. That's what I'm looking for. When you have this right to travel, you have these rights, both the federal offers a protection and the state offers a protection. Unless you have invoked a tra transportation law, a, tra a specific federal protection, because you have the right to travel in both jurisdictions, doesn't necessarily invoke the federal jurisdiction. And so the amending of the complaint, though it wasn't that clear, wasn't always also so clear to hand the jurisdiction to the federal government, which is what you, by my estimation on all this, you, you need to avoid. So the dynamic in this case is, is absolutely imperative to understand I've got a link to A.G. Raul defends rep removal of a, Repub a Republic, a Republican Bailey suit to federal court because they mentioned that in the case. The court gives weight to some of this, but shows that they don't agree with what the state asserted. In other words, you have an attorney in the state to be the top attorney defending the governor, and they are making all the wrong arguments to make it look like they have authority. That's what they're doing to you. They make it look like they have authority. And in this case, we had a magistrate that looked like they decided pretty clearly that's not the case, even though it was stated, even though it was claimed. Now, let me move into the Bailey decision and read a little bit from it. The analysis, defendants may remove a civil action from state court to a federal district court located in the place where such an action is pending as long as the federal district court had original jurisdiction over the case. You hear me talking jurisdiction all the time. Governor Pritzker, as the party seeking removal, he moves it from the state court case to the federal jurisdiction. This case, this, uh, this view from the magistrate is looking at whether or not he can receive the case. In this case, he decides not to, and he remands it back to the court of original filing in the state. Governor Pritzker, as a party seeking removal, bears the burden of establishing federal jurisdiction exists. There is a strong presumption in favor of remand. You want to talk about understanding what your presumptions are. This is what it's all about at this point. Understanding what the burdens are and the, and the presumptions, and working to protect one way or the other, whether it's against you, you, you refute it. If it's not, you protect it so that it, it moves in your direction. And the district court must narrowly, narrowly interpret removal statutes. Doubts over jurisdiction should be resolved in favor of remand. So the court's developing the logic behind, and then, and then he says this is in the analysis on how he's going to come to the conclusion that there's, there wasn't a invocation of a federal law which would provide the jurisdiction, federal court jurisdiction. The court is guided by the principle the federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, a function of the restriction placed upon the federal judiciary by both the United States Constitution and by federal law. It is a fundamental principle of federalism that federal courts may bear only uh, certain claims, such as those rising, raising federal questions or arising under the laws of the United States citing Constitu U.S. Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1, while, quote, this constitutional grant of judicial authority is broad, the Constitution gives Congress the power to further refine the actual scope of federal jurisdiction, citing a case. Isn't that what they did with the territorial jurisdiction? I point you in Title 28, 81 to 133 or so, where you're looking for your actual Article 3 court. Congress may, quote, Congress may not expand the jurisdiction of the federal courts beyond the bounds established by the Constitution, but it may impose statutory limits on it. See, so it's limiting here. Uh, the, again, I don't, without a, some of the context, it's probably a little bit more difficult to discuss this than I think you need to read. 
uh, about it. I'm trying to cut through here quickly. The reference to the Constitution rights includes rights that are recognized by both the United States Constitution and the Illinois Constitution, and the amended complaint could but does not specify that it seeks redress solely for violations of Bailey rights under the state Constitution. So here's what I was saying before relative to these pointers. Cite your state laws. Cite your state code. Don't incorporate federal authorities. When you look very carefully, they're not really available to you different in a way through the federal government anyway. But you're going to raise this ability of the court going to reach into your case and yank you out of the state remedy. The decisions of the decisions for health and even let's say your wildlife, that's all state solely exclusive state functions. Let me read down here right the references to the constitutional rights include this is one that was claimed by Bailey, include include the rights to that are, that are recognized by both the United States Constitution and the, the Illinois Constitution, an amended complaint could but does not specify that it seeks redress solely for violations of Bailey's rights under the state constitution. The argument that is that this is a case that clearly raises no federal claims is too confidently stated. Parenthetically, that's by the state. There is a federal right to travel secured by the Constitution, but there is also a federal right to travel secured by the Illinois Constitution. Article 1, Section 2, establishing due process protection and stating that, quote, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor be de denied the equal protection of laws noting that the general right to travel was protected by the due process clause as cited through City of Chicago versus Morales. For all of you right to travel, folks, there's a citation here. The amendment protects the rights to free expression and religion and the right to assemble, but Illinois' Constitution protects those rights as well. Article 1, Section 3, even Bailey acknowledges that his allegations are fairly framed as claiming the governor's al alleged outreach restricted his ability to travel associate with others and practice his faith. It is a fair reading by Governor Pritzker to conclude that Bailey's claims are couched in constitutional terms and may be constitutional claims. What does that mean? Relative to the case, when it came down to paying the foot in the bill for Bailey going to court, because Bailey's attorney didn't write it specific to show clearly he was staying within state law, Pritzker was given right here the ability to reasonably presume he had the right to remove the case to federal court. And so, therefore, Bailey's has to foot the bill for Bailey's attorney. And this, I wanted to read down to this section. This is also, when you're looking at everything you're looking at doing in the case, when you come to the point of who's going to pay the bills, you want to make sure you don't make any of these, these mistakes. And it would have simply have been, to solve that would have been stating it very clearly that your, your rights, were from the Constitution or maybe some statutory provision. And the attorney failed to do that for his client. That's why I say you probably only, you, each one of you are the only one that are going to look up for your interest your best, your best. So it doesn't sound like much in there, but he gives the governor a fair, the fair reading. He gives reasonable interpretation that would have allowed the state governor to move this into a federal jurisdiction. Then he moves the court goes on. That said, the court recognizes that Illinois has an independent declaratory judgment statute that creates a cause of action for challenging statutory or executive overreach. And so there's a clue. You can use the declaratory judgment, I would say, in conjunction with other remedies. For what? Challenging statutory or executive overreach. I would focus more on the overreach for COVID, wouldn't you? Where you have you call for evidence that they've complied with the law because you can't find any anywhere. anywhere? Here's what you can use as a remedy. They, show, they specifically say declaratory judgment. Well, those are both in federal and state. So that it was in the state and not only in the federal was this point here for this ju uh, magistrate was that because it's in both places, I can't say that this is clearly stating a federal claim. And so I'll, I'll stop right there. I think the most important parts were the right to travel to give you a case 
Its federal rights are recognized. Remember, I discussed with you how you do it from as an ingress egress right appurtenant to the disposals of the highway from the federal government under the grants acts for this for that such as in the mining law 1866 why it's important to you all because section 8 is the grant of the construction of highways as a right and your right to travel is not under the motor vehicle code it's under the uh, the restriction against obstruction by the government in the road law for your roads they say two Law, federal rights to travel are secured in both the United States and Illinois' Constitution. should raise an eyebrow a little bit. But where are they? They're actually due process clause provisions for no person shall be deprived of liberty. There's your due process I've been talking about forever. That is probably the last thing you have to protect yourself. So when you start making these discussions in letter or whatever your papers or your remedies, be very specific. Don't be afraid to understand your condition so well and your rights so well that you make them very specifically stated on their origins and go through the right passage of it. This is saying that your right to travel is a due process consideration. It's protected. I'm adding the ingress and egress rights right grant is, an, is adds, adds the on top of that the proof of the fact the source of that is the obligations of the federal to the state through the enabling acts relative to disposals of public land and to the fact of the highway, which are not commercial. The Motor Vehicle Code of which regulates that. So this is off the point of the COVID, which you're looking at due processes. Your right to travel is a due process consideration. It's not the right to travel. You actually should be at the liberty concern. And so it all depends on, I mean, we get locked. I notice we get locked in lots of things that we really have to pay attention to what's being said. We're being, it's a, we're being told what it's about, but we kind of refuse that. We want to say what ought to be, but just kind of instead of going down the path that sits there for us to do. No, this site, this case cites another, uh, another case for this right relative to the right liberty. It had to do with another case, the uh, city of uh, Chicago and loitering laws. And the court makes some discussions in there relative to uh, it was the city of Chicago uh, and Morale. And they make an interesting discussion about loitering and your rights relative to all this, these things and how you can analyze something sounding plausible from the state is actually not, not lawful. And if you haven't read a couple of these types of cases to understand how the courts treat that, you likely not put in your paperwork the phraseology and or the points, the statement facts that would place you in the protected point that side and removing the presumption that the government has the right because just because it says like the attorney general, the head bar member in the state stated completely wrong relative to their ability to, to rem remove a case and the court saying, well, okay, well, the, you could reasonably say there was a removal. However, because of the question, the failure of the petitioner to expressly invoke federal authority, I'm not going to take it. And for the, this is now to the patriots that so called out there that would claim these, your, the, the complaint, the petitioner directs the case. That's it. That's that part right there. Your petition, what you write, uh, makes or breaks what you do. And so I've been attempting to give people the idea how to best as I can see that it's done, make the better the better position and better complaint. Why? Because in this question, this remanding back to the state, now you see the state authority is relevant. You need you see the state authority can prevail against the feds, and you see why, and then you realize that your state health codes are strictly state, your rights are discussed, imposed, are st talked through st strictly state, what are you doing there? You're removing the art for those some of those that you know that some of you that know this. You're removing the effect of what the Fourteenth Amendment, aren't you? That's all civil rights again. See, so it starts to play in why it starts to become powerful. What I've been trying to tell you through other ways of discussion, and I only mention that to those of you all because you want to make the Fourteenth Amendment your bane and you can't do nothing, uh, but and it makes you that that citizen subject, but it doesn't. 
It depends on how you direct what you want to do. And I've been attempting to, I've been saying it, whether my attempt is that it's in the receiver. I can transmit. Is, do I have someone out there that is tuned to what I'm saying or will continue to work to become tuned to what I'm saying? And we get ourselves in a better place, in a better position. And why are we wanting to do that? Why do we take the objective basis through? Why do we look at what the judges, even if they're occupiers, are saying? Because if we comport to our actions and our paperwork to that, we eliminate all those things that are questions that anybody who doesn't do it doesn't know when the court sees that you're ignorant of something and utilizes that as an out because they're not intending justice actually. I suggest what I do to try and eliminate all the questions that I've ever seen that come to me, that I've ever seen when doing my studies on court cases, what people did to try and defend themselves and then lose. How I analyze how they lost, what the court said, like these subtleties. The one appellate court said, well, they argued that the, the quarantine laws were violative of constitutional rights. And if that's what they did, that case was determined correctly because what the argument should have been was, they didn't do something within the law that didn't violate the rights, the due process that the quarantine laws did provide. They failed in some fashion there and violated my rights is a different point. And you have to hold on. You have to hold on to that for your dear life because they'll try and they'll try and rest you of your own point. And if you know your subject matter, they won't be able to do it. And then in protection of that, you'll then now turn the attention on the judge. You can out them in your responses. Again, like I said, I think I suggested uh, using judicial notice of the facts, and you bring out some facts that correlate to the failure, correlate to the consequences on the failure, and then you start focusing in on whether the judge is going to do what the code says or allow the, the harm. That's a, a little, little bit more of an extension. But it's you managing your case based on you not making as mi any mistakes, hopefully, as you might if you didn't constrain your discussion to the absolute thing that you need to talk about in the proper way. When you're talking right to travel, you're talking about someone's interfered with the due process that allowed you to maintain your right to travel. And if people got what I just said, as I think that through, You'll just like, you'll move one more seat closer to the front of the class. Because this is, again, it's how they're doing it to us. And if we don't figure this out, and this is the, where I want to keep going back, it's getting getting worse and worse. And until someone actually tests it, the worst comes on us because why? Again, the presumptions that the government does no wrong. It has the experts to make the decisions correctly, and it's presumed that they are and that the, anything they say goes. Now here we have that instigation of that, how dire it starts to become, and yet when someone steps up really quickly here, we see the, the, the effect of anybody stepping up that has standing to do so. New Zealand to put COVID-19 patients into mandatory quarantine camps. And this is all, there are big old smiles. This prime minister was a big old smiles about how, well, if you don't listen to what we say and you don't want to take the test, and you don't respond by saying, but there is no test, and your PCR is irrelevant, and you haven't done the T-cell, and, all, and, 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 you don't have all these lists of defenses for yourself, then they get to put you in these camps, and if you don't take the test, we'll put you in twice as long, because I get to influence your decision. Well, you put that in the context that got no basis, now we've got an extortion, okay? Well, this is what came out, and within, I think, a day or two, the the answer came... Well, let me read this first part. New Zealand's Director General of Health, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, for those of you listening for that aspect of this, Bloomfield announced at, at a press conference that the users of quarantine facilities marked a major departure from the how positive cases were managed by the health officials when New Zealand was last at level three, and cases earlier in the year were told to simply self-isolate in their homes. For this, for those of us looking in, this is where someone's stepping up and saying, hey, they're, they're changed the goalpost. That would inc be incorporated in something you would develop if you're going to a remedy. But they've had to change the goalpost because they didn't have anything, and they need to change the goalpost to make it look like a pandemic. The shifting of goalpost, goalpost of which shows there's nothing certain. 
And because there's nothing certain, they can change the goalposts, both of which were not were violative of the due process that was required if they were going to go to this power. Dr. Bloomfield says mandatory quarantine will apply to both new cases and, if necessary, close family members who might be at risk. The Italian doctor says don't test. Don't test your kids. They're going to go through your little goats, test your little goats, and once they find positives, then we know the machines throw positives because they're designed to do that because they need to increase the numbers. They're coming after your family, and they're going to force all the tests on your family. And if you do the test, that gives them license to come after you with the vaccine. He's telling you exactly what I've been saying in a different way. And so they're going to make influence you to do, if you don't take the test in New Zealand, they're going to put you in a concentration camp, uh, whether you're not healthy or not, because they have the power to do, do so, because they haven't checked that out. And then they're, they're going to coerce you into stay having to stay with them for 30 days. And most people aren't going to have a word in their mouth, first of all. Secondly, they won't do a habeas if that happens to them. And thirdly, they'll uh, just capitulate because it's easier. Yeah. And this is how they take your rights. So then someone steps up and argues that that's improper. New Zealand's first lockdown ruled unlawful by country's high court. Very interesting discussion here. The first high court to knock it all out, right? You have to go look and see how they did it. You got to go see what they said. And you're going to have to, this is not a little, this is great, but it's a little bit disappointing to what they extended the government to do. You have to know what that is because once you know what that is, you should be able to put in the paperwork that they couldn't do it. Why? Because they're making laws that are in violative of your rights without knowing a provable infectious agent. There is no test. And so they made a, essentially a law against nothing that they can prove. And so you're going to have, as they move this along, it'll be tougher and tougher of what you have to know and how you have to respond. New Zealand's High Court has ruled that the country's first nine day COVID 19 lockdown from March 23rd, 22nd, excuse me, March 26th to April 3rd was unlawful as it infringed on people's rights and freedoms without legal basis. Now, if, they, if that's nine days is no good, how about you sitting for eight, nine months now? Seven, eight, what, eight, seven months, whatever? doesn't matter. Too long. The High Court of New Zealand ruled on Wednesday that the country's stay-at-home orders under threat of punishment. <laughs> Remember, punishment means you've been a criminal. Uh, were in breach of civil liberties, not civil rights, civil liberties, protected by due process, after lawyer Andrew Barrowdale launched a suit against the government in July. Well, here's a lawyer. I don't think I want to call him an attorney. Someone doing the law. Perfect. Maybe they're out there still, folks. A panel of three judges waved off a number of associated complaints, but conceded that the authorities should have written the order into law before using the threat of police detention to keep people inside. So the court gives them the answer on how they're going to solve the problem that is otherwise unlawful. If they just write it into law, you're stuck. And so that makes us around the world have to look and see the rule of law is going this direction. We're going to have to combat that a certain way. So as long as it's not in the law, they can't do it. When it is in the law, as I said, then they can the problem is then you then now on the other side you're limited to being argued they didn't comply with that and so that still would bring up i would say without knowing how they're going to fix this if they don't have that infectious agent they have no authority to determine a thing about mitigation measures and so my my focus on this early on is still holding while he said they go on to say this court where while there is no question that the requirements was necessary was was necessary, reasonable, and proportionate response to the COVID-19 crisis at the time. The requirement was not prescribed by law and was therefore contrary to Section 5 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights, uh, the ruling read. Well, let's go back through that. Again, the government was given the presumption of necessary, reasonable, and proportionate. Those are three things, three elements I'll tell you, you have to defeat by showing, again, they don't have the evidence of the initiating cause, and in this case, there's evidence that there is no test, and we have that by objective proof, like the CDC saying, we don't have a test for SARS-CoV-2. But it, they are presumed to have necessary, reasonable, and proportionate response, and the courts gave it to the government, which shows you these are the three elements you have to defeat 
whenever you're looking at what they're doing. And then it says, at the time, I've talked about this as well, this changes over time. The fact that it's gone eight months since March in all jurisdictions around the world, all mitigation measures are thrown into compliance, even if you give them necessary, reasonable, and proportionate. Now you're twist, you're jumping on whether it was reasonable what they do, because whatever they've done, all they've done, has continued the condition, and they could anticipate a second wave, proving none of that was proportionate or reasonable, even if you give them necessary to respond to something, even a ghost. And that's the problem you write. You can see there's a little problem inside the law. The potential for it is the pro is a potential problem for you, and that's what you have to defeat as well. And I know a lot. There's a lot going on, but I told you this is the worst thing that a society could face and that would impose the most demands on the people if they're going to be vigilant to stop the tyranny against them. And to my mind, I'm seeing most people folding. And those that step up, we're having uh, we're having to take a long time to get oriented on what really is required. Even where to find this stuff is apparently uh, an issue. And I had to I just ran across this recently. Boy, one state is really not too good at all. It's just ridiculous. All, in fact, all these these websites that you see, most of them, if they don't give you a link to your rules and your laws relative, they don't. It's all fluff. They don't. It's a window dressing. They give you no information. Actually, what you need to know, which I guess some of you would say, yeah, we know that. I mean, that, that's what we'd expect. That's not the point. Of course, the, of, I understand that. The point is that, that they make it difficult for you to track down. You have to put in your mind you intend to stop this, and you have to put that stronger in your mind than you want to stop. And I mean, at some high level. Now, what I try to do when someone writes me. As I try to direct you as quickly as possible to what you have to focus on so that you don't get blown away by all the stuff that's available to see when you don't understand how to focus quite yet. Now, some of you might, but I haven't seen evidence that that's generally available to anybody. You're so overblown by the immensity of this thing. We've, we've Again, the, the smoke is too thick. We lose our way very quickly. And as I said before, it takes me, well, this last date was pretty, took a long time, a couple of hours to track it down, but finally did. I know what I'm looking for. In most states, it takes five to ten minutes to track down the statute no one sees. But it sits, sits there. And I read it to you in one state last week. And so, again, it's there. It just comes in slightly different forms. You're still focused on the same thing. You demand the evidence that they've complied with the law, and then you don't, not that they, that's, you don't say that they complied with the law. This, sta this statute requires you did a report or a confirmation of the infectious agent, can you produce evidence of that? Because I haven't found it on the website, and I haven't seen it declared, or I haven't seen it produced. That's at least the start question there. So a relevant statute imposing the duty to do so, what it was, there's a couple things that are actually there to do, but you ask specific to that, and you keep just on that point. Again, I'm not, we're not making any of this stuff up. And they hide it. They make it difficult unless you have some idea. It is difficult. I'm here to try and help guide as best as I can to get people up to speed because that's one of the things how they get you not to do it anymore. It's just too difficult. Your freedom, being, you being free of this, not freedom, but you're being free of this tyranny has to be more important about anything else you're doing. Notwithstanding, I know there's a lot of different varying things. Seriously, at some point, other considerations have to be decided to fall of less importance than what they plan for you. And that's quarantines, whether you're sick or not, length of time, you're not going to work, always conditioning your life, austerity imposed, modernization imposed, all the global governance things they've been looking for, all done through a fraud. Sweden's disease experts say, and, and despite this, Sweden's disease experts say, uh, says that just wearing a mask could be very dangerous. I don't know how many more times we're going to say this. Uh, well, I'm not, I don't know how many more times a piece of information we get to go do. We see right on the outside of the packages that the masks don't even protect against anything like, like what they're doing. They are actually, like I wrote in the 3M, actually tells you if you don't use it correctly, it can cause sickness and death. And yet... Noisome Newsome is influencing you to the theme of wearing some face covering and he's got a mask in his hands. And yet, Swedish disease expert says just wearing a mask could be very dangerous. 
Okay, you bring that up as a consequence of what the government hasn't done in your locale that had the duty to do, and you back it up with the statement from the company that issues the mask. This could be very dangerous. It could kill me if I do it wrong. And then it's the proper use in the data for the use of the mask. The data says that there's a proper use. Not just putting it on your face. I mean in what you use it for. you got two uses there. How you use it on your face or what you use it for. None of which is what the general public does. It is very dangerous to believe face masks could change the game when it comes to COVID, said Tingle. Anders Tingle, chief ep epidem epidemiologist of Sweden's public health agency. An equivalent to Dr. Do uh, Dr. Fall Prey to Fauci. Very dangerous. And uh, the, the product data sheet says that. It's sickness or death by using these things. Who would have ever thunk it? I would have never thought that all the times I've used a mask, they could kill me. When I'm using them legitimately, like for doing drywall or for pollen or whatever the heck I thought it was. And yet you have the effects. You know that it's when you wear them. I, you'd wear, you wear them for a reason. That, that the harm that you're going to cause for supposedly the short time you're going to need it isn't going to do more damage. A very dangerous kind of raises the level of damage when coupled up with the manufacturer's warning that says proper use, uh, improper use can lead to sickness and death. How's that? Are you using any of this for yourself? See, they're not supposed to push you to that limit as well. And they're doing it, again, with re regard to the protection of your liberty as the due process consideration. The statutory codes for how they impose their authority in epidemic, the failure to follow that is the due process failure. You got a due process failure that they failed to do to comply with the law that would bring them into some utility lawfully, and then that the consequence of that is to then breach due process relative to your rights, whatever you think they are. I don't know. I'm not going to here to define or limit them. It could be one thing that's just good enough, or it could be a whole bunch of them. I've suggest I'll suggest to you when government goes bad, you'll be days and days writing how bad and unlawful all these laws are. So I've just told, I've decided for myself, and I explain, I expose, explain to you, pick the top three or five. Go with the best top three or five. It all depends. You can do one if you have to, if it's strong enough. And to my mind, it's a little bit of a gamble to go one because of the uncertainty of the judiciary being what it is, being we were occupied. My view is we're an occupied people, and I've been able to prove it. For myself, my actions, what I do, what, what happens... Folks, when you can go to the Supreme Court of a state and you can argue everything was done in, in violation of the law, you can go there and, and have the court grant a waiver of all rules to do justice, and then they deny you the law, you realize that there's, there's just a, no, no protection. And so this becomes that mass problem. We have to know as ourselves, not looking for everyone else to do it, each one of us has done the thing until we raise the awareness enough that we saw in Virginia for the for the rights of the the right to bear arms, it rises up to a level that the whole society's going to act to alter or abolish. Now we fell short there, but Virginia's got another time coming. Mandatory COVID vaccine, flu-like symptoms vaccines, if no less, if you remember how to read that. All right, so you think that. You think it's getting lighter. I told you it wouldn't until people start stepping up in the proper way. My my thought is once enough people, um, I mean maybe a hundred, a couple hundred or more, really start focusing hard on the right point, I think they're going to start to back off. And it'll be a natural consequence for them to, they've gone so far as they can go, and now they're the, beehive, the, the hornets are now coming. I can only hope that that happens and that you'd all step up for yourself. But here's more enforcement. When the presumptions are going with the government, and no one refutes any bit of it, uh, Representative Bailey in Illinois is, I, I don't know what to say, the guy's doing, uh, even as it, and in artfully, as they say, artfully, craftily, and this is not a good thing, artfully, uh, his attorney didn't do it. Uh, the effort to stop this is, is important. Anybody in Illinois needs to support that, but I would say if you can extend more into what I'm saying, you're going to be a lot more 
position to challenge the presumptions given to the government. They're given by this presumption the ability to do just about anything they want. Now AI-driven robots will enforce mandatory face mask rules. Now AI-driven face detection robots will enforce mandatory face mask, face mask rules. The AI robot can also keep a record of violators and repeat offenders of those who fail to wear masks. What will be the consequence? Consequences of mask offenders has not been re yet revealed. Now, so we're going to, you understand all the technology that's sitting in there, face recognition, uh, presumption that they're right, the order to wear masks that the other experts around the country, around the world are saying are, are very dangerous. The manufacturers of the masks are saying are uh, life threatening at some point and, and induce sickness. Uh, the face coverings of which are useless at any in any regard no due process in the implementation of this as soon as one of these comes in your area and you may be subject you can move to enjoin it from being used the data collection of third parties you don't know where how they're going to get your face how, if you how you how do you have in between the, the, the determination you've been an offender once that you have due process to protect yourself against any that and the subsequent measure uh, reportings. All this sits there to be done by any one of you coming possibly to a, a local jurisdiction new year, near you. A major Hollywood studio has ordered an AI-driven mass face mask detection robots to enforce mandatory face mask rules. Mandatory face mask doesn't sound like an influence. It sounds like mandatory. So Noisem Newsom was lying. But he wasn't lying because if they know they're being criminals and they're waiting for the first man or woman to step up and, and, and challenge it, I'm sure. And no, no, nobody has. Millions of people. It's astonishing to me. I just want to just sit back and just revel at the stupidity of it all. I don't even know what more to say. What more do I say about that? And so, so here we hear also a private organization's doing it. Well, they've influenced a private organization to interfere with you. And when you're in those third-party engagements, I told you those are kind of tough. Especially when it means your, it means your, uh, your employment or something like that. The contract or whatever. And so what you would probably have to do is turn around and do what I'm saying independently. You get a declaratory judgment. You just don't sue for injunction. You do get a declaratory judgment based on the fail. You get your letter that says they didn't have the evidence of how they comply with the law. It says that they're outside their authority because they haven't determined an infectious agent and the due process of the state to protect the due process of your liber uh, required to protect your liberty was not followed. And so you want to declare that to be invalid against you, at least, if not those similarly situated. And I said you likely may not get this similarly situated because of the way these early court cases came down, but. It's, I've told you, those pointed out, each one of you has to do this for yourself. Don't look out. It's not everybody else not acting. It's you. Each one of you. So here they, they're coming down harder and harder. You're, again, the escape routes are being uh, being plugged on a bunch of criminals that will uh, cry to you in a public meeting and say, I don't have anything to do but influence what this theme is to get you to comply. They keep the question floating, and it's up to you to make things certain. Because they won't. The criminal won't. US, okay, so moving on along as the consequence of all this, you, you, I told you they got, the government got e-government. It wants to go digital. I told you, I told you a long time ago, they're going to get their dang, dang block, blockchain. They're going to get their social credit. They already got the credit, so it's going to be social credit. The credit system, the monetary system, the, whatever you do has to go through your phone and all that stuff. Well, the USPS of all, of all organizations, just filed a patent for blockchain-based secure voting system. It looks like the United States Post, Post Office uh, is getting in the business of voting. It has recently been unearthed that the USPS filed a patent for a patent on February 7, 2020, for a secure voting system that uses a blockchain access layer. Obviously, this uh, could be one of the strongest signals to welcome adaption to the blockchain by U.S. government since the blockchain was thrust on the map by, by Bitcoin. A voting system can use the security of blockchain and the mail to provide a reliable voting system, the patent application says. A voter, a registered voter receives a computer-readable code in the mail and confirms identity and confirms correct ballot information in, the, in an election. The system separates voter identification and votes to ensure voter anonymity and stores votes on a distributed ledger in a blockchain. Well, I'm not going to tell you how all that, I've already told you how rotten that all is. It doesn't, it's, it's laughable. 
But what business does UPS have spending all their money on developing this in the first place that they're having trouble delivering the mail? And it's the service, not the post office. Understand that distinction. That you also see here you have to be a registered voter. That's one of your nemesis. When you go look at that status, you'll understand how the 14th Amendment applies. Okay? Maybe I should just stop right there and let you do the research. Uh, how to cut ties and how to cut, start keeping distance is how you start to do that. You're going to be a registered voter for a citizen of the United States relative to your powers, which are just voting. You admit to that with your voter registration. It puts you into that status. You're a federal citizen. How's that? It's not separate anymore from the state either. It shows you your state is what the CIA World Factbook says, is administrative division of the federal. Why I hear Tennessee troopers are actually DA, uh, Department of Homeland Security agents in a recent thing that I don't have up for the tabs. But anyway, it doesn't matter. And I mean, a lot can be said about this. It's, it's completely in the process of bringing together global governance underneath that system that uh, wants to be cashless and uh, control your life and then force upon you that the the condition that you're in this direct democracy nonsense and then out you when you're not, right? I mean, then to get all this, you're going to need to be getting those mandatory vaccines. The future's not looking too good. And while they have all of that, one of the criticisms for me on all this blockchain is digital. They want to give you the e-government, how, and everyone knows now how bad it is. The representatives are complaining left and right. Nobody steps up to stop it, but it doesn't matter. So we, we're just a whining, complaining society, apparently, and that's the problem. We're not, we're not uh, vigilant men and women of backbone that will protect ourselves at every, at every, at the, at, at the cost of ourselves at some point. Though I'm not asking you to do that. Absolutely not. In fact, I'm asking you not to do that. We don't go there first. We show that the failures are out there, but here, they're based in the UP, USPS, which invested lots of money to get to get this patent, to be in the crux of it by a governmental service for digital blockchain. When we hear this, Microsoft put off, fix it, put off fixing zero day for two years. A security flaw in the way Microsoft Windows guards users against malicious files was actively exploited in the malware attacks for the last two years before last week when Microsoft finally issued a software update to correct the problem. Well, if that's your life, if that's your voting rights, if that happens at an election time, if that's your finances, if that's your payments, if that's your contracts, somebody could care less. Microsoft, the same guy who started Microsoft is Gates. He's the same guy that wants to infect your kids and poison them and cause these tests to come on to you. I mean, do you see the program here? I hope you do. And I don't mean just, to, oh, yeah, I see the program. No, you don't see the program. If you really saw the program, you would be defending yourself against the program. And it's not what I'm telling you about. It's how they're doing it that you defend yourself from. But these people will put, leave a, a zero-day exploit available for two years, and you're going to rely and not going to fight against the imposition of this or argue if some of you might want to, because there's millions of us. We can do all kinds of arguments. The USPS w did fraud, waste, and abuse on a thing that their mission is not to do. You know that's money to you if you figure those out. You know that, folks? So, the, the underlying hardware, software to the hardware, you got the hardware problem, then you got the software vulnerabilities. They're building a big uh, existence for you on all of this. And you're going to sit back and, for those of you that vote, you're going to, you have to be registered as a citizen of the United States over there in Washington, D.C. You're, you're a resident. You are an alien in the state that you reside in. You understand all this stuff. And yet, and, and that's who's, who they're working on. And you never make a record that you may not be that, not by stating it. It's your sovereignty. Your private sovereignty is not that you call yourself sovereign. It's how you respond. And as long as you're not, the courts have told you that they they believe they're doing doing it right. Do you right? And yet, so we put e-government together with all this digital stuff and these exploits. It just sits there. We already talked about the one that sits in the chips, and they make more. And they, I think, you know, again, why wouldn't they make more? They're all on the take for the governmental uh, military side. This is the military you know, occupation, which people don't fully appreciate, I don't think. In a major victory over Pat Pentagon, CIA is authorized to expand offensive cyber operations. No, offensive, excuse me. 
Yeah, same difference. Who do you think controls this place, this digital world that they're forcing you on, that you're not responding to? And you, you hear all these things, these notices to you on how this world's going to be tracking down to beat you down and you're not going to say a thing is really astonishing to me. And as I've said, you know, I read about these registrations and all this. I cut as many of those out and it's to the point now, I'm not in many places that, that I have standing to argue at this point. There's nobody that affects my rights adversely yet. Yet. And so I'm not, I'm kind of cut myself out of all the, it's the freedom. I, it's a being free in a certain kind of interesting way, but you're, you're helpless. You're, you're handing, you're sitting there with it, watching the fire, the building burn down. You have a bucket of air. You can't, you can't help. You got the bucket. I can show you what to put in it, but I got nothing to put in it because I'm not the privileged class anymore. I'm outlaw. Yeah, your blue leaks. How the FBI tracks Bitcoin laundering on the dark web. You think they, what, is that all that they're going to, is that all they're going to track, the laundering? The whole system is a big money laundering, a big rights laundering condition. So, go ahead. The USPS is going to make voting system and get a patent for it. And, well, they, I don't know if they got it. I can't remember now what I read there, but they at least applied for it. And they're going to put yourself into a blockchain technology. And the FBI's got access to everything government, don't they? CIA's got access to everything government. And you're going to turn your life without a whimper... Uh, turn your life over to all that. What am I? Why are we talking about voting? Well, it's because of this fraud and COVID. You can't go to polling places. Oh no, you can protest out in the middle of the street uh, in in thousands and thousands and protest against voting. It's too confining, but you can't go vote. And I told you what you see these dichotomies like this. There's a real problem, and it's more than just acknowledging it and laughing at it or not responding to it because these things are fundamental to your life. These things are fundamental to how your life is going to be and the future of your little ones. And I'm just going to say it right here, what it just strikes me. It was so easy in order to stop it and make a record of it. I, this COVID allows you to open the can here. I'm talking you, the people. And yet, no one wants to do the first. No one wants to break the vacuum on the can. It seems I, I don't. I don't get it. Well, at least I should say no one is capable yet. You want to, but we're an ignorant society apparently against how to resolve this, which is still astonishing. So, uh, anyway, I hope uh, I've done said something today to really inspire you to protect yourself, folks. There's plenty of ammunition here. Uh, Grimner, I thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com and uh, Jules over at ucwa.tv and doing the broadcast uh, back on Thursday. Folks can get it there. Anybody commenting, thank you. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thank you for interacting. Uh, the commenters over there at Sam, uh, Sound Minds, thank you. And Sound Minds, appreciate what you do in normalization of ignorance. Minds, bit shoot, everywhere there. Thank you for what you do on sending the word out and getting, more importantly, under Really, take it important what I'm telling you to do for yourself. Nobody can do this for you. Nobody. Can't look out and say everyone's not doing it. Yes, they're not doing it. That's just the herd. If you're going to stand there and watch the herd run around you, you're just part of the herd. Protect yourself, if you will, please. Thank you. I'll be with you next week. Tech diffs or nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose. Whoop ass feels like. Son.
I just opened a whole case of wolf ass. 